Okay, hi. Um, so welcome to today's video. Uh, today's video, I think, is actually going to be like a good one. Uh, basically, it's intended to be almost, and I need to start looking into the camera because I've realized I don't do that. Today's video is intended to be like kind of a follow up to the last video on the 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 Lord the oh God. the miseducation of the Black Brit. But again, I really have like, I know where I want to go, but it's just becoming a bit more vague and I really want to take my time and like, do like videos that are just building a sentence that will have loads of like, subordinate clauses, but a sentence nevertheless. And I think where I'll pick up from is basically talking about the poor representation and the lack of nuance in uh, black expression particularly when it comes to black masculinity. And this video is going to lack a black British view because I think when you're exploring a lot of these ideas and like in terms of research, what is available is a lot to do with like uh, general Western, uh, the general Western black diaspora, but then also particularly the US. Again, I've spoken in videos about US, the US and American culture as its main um, export and I think that needs to be um, that should be considered that should be noted uh, but then there's also room for uh, a black British perspective or black British understanding or frame a black British framework which we'll get to you know we'll get there but essentially I wanted to explore again that dilemma of um, just the lack of nuance in uh, blackness um western society seems very um content in de dehumanizing us um or, or presenting two extremes that that contradict each other um in many ways and don't allow for like again a textured nuance uh humanity does that make sense yeah and I wanted to explore two main archetypes uh, in in this concept. And I would call them the n and the coon, but um, I'm just worried about, maybe I'll just censor it. Yeah, the n and the um, Yeah, and then actually I think then I can go to talk, bring in a Black British perspective, but that's not gonna be in this video. All right, we'll start off with We'll start off with the n and looking at it as a masculine, a masculinity archetype. I think that's the framework. That's the, we're looking at masculinity, black masculinity archetypes. That's how I might title the video. Go you. So the masculinity archetype was based on ideas originating from the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade to essentially justify the whole thing. And they would build these archetypes um, and understanding of just in general blackness, again, to dehumanize, to devalue and to justify what is categorically abhorrent. So one informative uh, text in the social construction of black people at the time was Edward Long's uh, The History in Jamaica. So it's this book which is not just which is not just a geographical guide to Jamaica, but it frames Negroes as brutish, ignorant, idle, crafty, mistrustful, and superstitious people with a nature even below that of brutes. And again, this social construction was very advan advantageous in the development of the slave trade, furthered by those in influence um, in society. The third president of the United States. Thomas Jefferson says this in Notes on the State of Virginia. Besides those of colour, figure and hair, there are other physical distinctions proving a, a difference of race. They seem to require less sleep. They are, I'm even in my gown, I've just realised, who cares? And more adventuresome. They are more ardent after their female. And love seems with them to be a more eager desire than a delicate tender of sentiment and sensation. Which isn't biological it's not a physical distinction as it said that's just socialization i would say but he's basically creating this this strong biological distinction between black and white as well as presenting black people as lesser counterparts jefferson implying that black people are more uh, 
physically and sexually adept than white people. This dichotomy encouraged economical engagement from the masses who would buy black men and women under the pretenses that they could be manipulated into subservient laborers. And as the idea of slavery became a bit more ingrained into just society, this idea became more apparent with black men being these weak beings who can be basically cultured into submission. However, after the American Civil War and the 13th Amendment, the Reconstruction era in American history saw the return to this archetype. It was birthed from this fear of black men who are now free from the chains of slavery and they can now freely operate in this uncivilized, animalistic behavior, which is part of their innate nature. Another factor to this was the fear that black men would seek revenge or some sort of justice to right the wrong of slavery, as they rightfully should, not just through violence, but their sexuality became a colossal role in the way that black men were villainized by their white counterparts. This is not just in the context of the transatlantic slave trade, but even with colonialism and African liberation, these agendas and ideas were being, were being run. Ideas of black masculinity were centered around black men being hyper, hyper viral, feral, not feral, but virile, with a high sex drive and large penises. Um, and we're falling again, it's annoying. And an adept ability in sex and pleasuring women. The growing fear was that these <laughs> would exact their revenge through having sex with white women who were unable to protect themselves from the sexual advances of a black man. Um, and black men who were being framed as these physical and sexual beings now served as a threat, not just only to women, but to white masculinity and white power. This was metaphorically represented in the rise of lynchings and mob lynches, where castration was administered on the accused black men as almost a symbolization of the stripping of power and emasculation of the black man. Also, literature began to focus on the physical and again sexual threat of the black man with a particular focus on murder and rape. A famous example of this is in the 1915 film, uh, The Birth of, of a Nation, which saw black men portrayed as rapists, murderers and lawless, lawless citizens. This shows the societal link between criminality and black men. No, the societal agenda to link criminality with black masculinity. <laughs> Don't know why you did that. Okay, so that's the like historical um, narrative to the n I'm now going to introduce a, the, the, the second arch black masculinity archetype, and that's the coon. Because then I think they kind of like, they weave into each other, and you'll see it. So, the coon. During slavery, the portrayal of black men began to shift from physical and sexual brutes to being known as docile and at contentment with serving and pleasing their slave masters. This was a direct follow-up to the economical fuel tactics used by slave traders to convince the American population to buy a slave, based on this idea that black men can be cultured into a civilised way of living. Civilised way of living, like that. Civilised, that's a key word here. The presentation of black people began to justify the means of slavery and suggest that black people basically had happily accepted their role in society. And I think like it's always gonna, it's, I, I feel like it's really important to discuss this book because like an Uncle Tom is another like name for a like, just like someone who's just like a bit of a pick me, um, feels this need to assimilate to whiteness, which again, we'll talk about, we'll talk about, but, um, but yeah, this, this Uncle Tom is actually a character from a book, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Written from a pro-abolitionist stance, the author attempted to educate white readers on the reality of slavery and push white readers to be more sympathetic to the bleaks. The main character in the book was called Uncle Tom and he was a gentle Christian slave who was loyal to his different slave masters despite his derog derogatory treatment throughout the book. 
And then again, despite the book having some sense of good intent, um, trying to fight off negative connotations of black men, like we explored with the nigger, the book basically spawned this whole genre of, li of literature, which featured black characters who were basically like willing to comply with slavery. And then that's why you have like literary figures like Mammy, Uncle Remus, who are all like conforming to slavery. And then I think because of this, a lot of these traits are generally viewed as quite feminine. So, and I guess that that, that, that talks about the intersection of like the patriarchy and how racism, it just, it feeds off it. Because now, like, these feminine, what is perceived as feminine qualities are now being cast onto, like, the Western cultural psyche about black men. Um, I would love to include, like, I would love to include... I'm going to finish the book. There's a book that I'm... I, I've, I've read, I read in year 12 and I've just not finished it. So black men were presented as docile, gentle, caring, with an affection towards children which mirrored the role in which women had at the time. Again, that link. Um, and that's also how black women were portrayed through the mammy stereotype. However, this is a great, a great detriment to black masculinity just because we know how misogyny basically villainizes femininity. Um, and for a woman to be feminine that's an that's a patriarchal affirmation but for a man to be feminine that's like a it's a no so in some sense black women had a place to reside in in the context of a white dominated society in the sense that like you 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 fit that you fit that role do you get what i mean whereas black men were being presented in this emphasis emasculated way which makes it difficult for them to find a place in a, in society that allows them to sit in like a normative sense of masculinity or, or, or the hegemonic that's it the hegemonic um ideal of masculinity which is whiteness and i think that's a good historical like a good historical like narrative on both of them and i think even like as i was going through them you can start to see how they weave together it's we have white hegemonic masculinity here uh this ideal that the west has created that justified slavery that was used um as a colonial tactic okay and then they've created these two these two main archetypes for black men to exist it's you're either gonna be this tribal hypersexual hyperphysical this black beast or you can like be really submissive um to us and that can be seen as a positive like being really submissive because um you you're basically doing what they were it's like putting it simply you're basically doing what they want you to do and you've just been like beaten to submission essentially and i feel like black men in like again and whilst talking about with media representation and providing healthy new archetypes i feel like sometimes black men always have to kind of swing with this pendulum of like and that's the reality of western society and maybe I'll, i'm gonna elaborate we'll do like a part two just like where i can like talk on my black personal experiences but i want this video to be very much like quite informative and can be used as a resource to learn about these archetypes. In the book, Black Male Representations of Masculinity in Contemporary American Art, the author, can't pronounce the name, God bless, um, says this, one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century is the Amer African American male, invented because black masculinity represents an amalgam of fears and projections in the American psyche, which rarely conveys or contains the trope of truth about black males existence popular culture serves as a key example of the modern day perpetuation of the idea of black men as physical and sexual beings nowadays unlike the days of the and the like in terms of a historical context um ideas of physicality and sexuality the very trait the very the very qualities used to animalize uh the black population have become intrinsically tied with masculinity and this has created a level of fetishism towards the black men 
um, I'm going to use one artist, um, Albert, um, Albert Watson. And this very particular way that he photographs black men. And it's almost like one critic of him says that it's almost like he sees black men as this specimen and he's pushing and he's pushing them to an unnatural degree. And I think it's always it, it, it's always interesting because like I feel like yes, black men, the image of like a black man can be like fetishized and like hypersexualized. But then it's also and, and this and this is where it like it 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 this is where they get you. This is where these these evil demonic, I mean demonic in a sociological context, don't again, you don't allow black men to like you hypersexualize them and fetishize them and then for them to actually explore like healthy sexuality, what 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 can they do? Because they're kind of backed into a corner. I'm gonna put up like on the screen like some examples of the stuff I'm talking about, like the type of images that I'm talking about, where I just feel like it's very it, it's pushing on an idea. It's pushing on an idea. And not all, it may not always be intentional, but maybe me, I'm just always going to see in that way. But I just think, you know what you're doing. Like, people know what they're doing. And even, like, the way people treat black male sexuality, BBC, blacked, it's this such, a, it's this really idealised, animalistic view of sexuality. That's not attainable. It's not the reality for every single black man but then you're 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 pushing on them to feel this pressure to be that to be that really hyper physical um sexualized image or you can create like this disdain for it like i don't want to be viewed as like an i don't want to be fetishized and there's a really interesting study i actually wanted to talk about there was a study where a group of white subjects were basically asked uh, more likely questions on superhuman and commonplace ability. So it'd be questions like, who's most likely to have like superhuman strength or like pick up a car? But then there'd be questions like, who's most, most likely to uh, be able to wash their things correctly or like do their laundry or be things like that. So that's what I mean, like commonplace and superhuman. So they would have to pick between a white face or a black face. And for the questions relating to the superhuman abilities, black faces were basically chosen 65% of the time. With the everyday task, it went down to 42. Just what, what are you, what like, what are you telling black people? You tap into this idea of like, oh, like black people are just like faster. Like you guys are just faster, right? Yeah, like black people, they're just stronger, just naturally stronger. It's so interesting because you benefit from it, but then it frees you up for explo exploitation because particularly like in America with like um, college football and basketball, you just have loads of like black people who like black, you have loads of young black men who have been brought up in this stereotype and then they're pushed into like these industries where they just get easily exploited. But then also on the other, on the flip side, you have like black males who can then feel a sense of inadequacy because of that, because they don't fit into that, like, they don't want to participate or lean into like physicality and strength and like athletic physical ability. Like, for example, me, all I would hear my life is like, I've got really big hands. I don't know. I just have big hands. I have really big hands. And like all the time, like, it would be the teachers there would be teachers that just be like, yeah, you play basketball, don't you? You must be really good at basketball. You'd be a great basketball player. Okay. And this, again, it's the line of like, where do you just like accept the comment as like, you know, they're just like, just making a physical observation, but then also the idea of it being rooted in something that's harmful. That's for up to you to decide. But again, ultimately, it creates a disparity between uh, black physicality and black intellectualism. And then also going like to the extreme end of like the nigger, the manifestation of the nigger archetype is that mm, I'm not giving this. I don't think I'm, I, I'm going to the nuance. I want to go into a bit more nuance. I love a good nuance. We'll go we'll go into a bit more nuance in another video. Right. That's what we have to do. We just have to keep going deeper, deeper, deeper because I'm not done. But then on the like the extreme end of the nigga, the link between criminality and black masculinity. Like one of the most lasting images in the Western consciousness 
is the black man posing a threat and the need for criminal punishment in order for him to be tamed. Being a disproportionate part of the prison population. And I think a lot, a lot of people, what a lot of people miss out in this conversation, particularly in the link between, between black masculinity and criminality, is that race and class play a role. So if you're essentially, this is the case for a lot of the black Western diaspora, you take people away from their homes, you displace their homes, you completely, they're part of this system. You say, oh, the system is done, you're free, even though legally, legally is very different to socially, culturally. There's these demonic forces there's these institutional demonic forces, harder to get housing, harder to get good jobs, not well-paying jobs, no social, just no social like um, foundation, no societal foundation for black people to comfortably sit on. But then again, it, got, it taps into like the coon thing, you expect this like performance, you expect, you, you expect submission on your own terms, like, but then now, like, when there is an issue, black youth, black men, in relation to crime, you don't want to see it as, like, an inherent societal problem, but you just want to see it as... And, and here's, what, here's what they do. They pin these ideas on the black structure. There was this really interesting US government report um, called the Moininian... Mon I don't say his name. Moininian report by David... Uh, Daniel Maninian called the Negro family the case for national action. And it basically blames the state of the black population, why they're being targeted by the police, why they um, why they're, they have a low social economical status on the black family structure, that it tends to be more matriarchal in nature due to you disempowering black men in their masculinity but again there's this blame on the matriarchal the presence of the, the the prominent presence of matriarchs in the black household that's the reason why not not you guys telling people to go kill black men because they're going to come and rape your women Okay, um, but then they continue. What what happens in the in the Western world is they continue to tap into these fears, the, the, the these fear these historic fears. So remember when I was talking about things like birth of the nature, the nation, and oh my gosh, black men they're gonna come and attack us because because they're finally free. Politics and the world of politics they tap into that as well. They tap into that stereotype. They still use they 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 have allowed that that they have allowed the ideology to fester and they tap into it for their convenience a famous example is george w bush's um, presidential election he basically um uh, came up with this ad for this um to basically justify uh the war on crime the war on crime yeah the war on crime and drugs at the time basically using a black a black prisoner to basically frame his whole campaign it's really interesting even in this country, Stephen Lawrence, what allowed that to happen? Um, we had our prime minister, our our prime minister say that that seeing a bunch of black kids out and about set alarm bells in his head. My teacher said that to me. <laughs> One of my teachers said that to my class. Yeah, she was like, she said if she saw a group of black boys walking on the road, she would cross the road. I think you even had the white kids who were saying the N-word. Even they were like, miss, you're racist. Anyways, anyways, anyway, so. So again, like, you, you just build up this really negative, negative extreme of black men, but you don't allow them, you don't really give them to space to overcome. And I feel like I'm going to need to add a bit more nuance. I already said this, I need to add a bit more nuance, but we'll do it in another video. And I think that's when, let, let's talk a bit, a bit about the because i think when you when you have this really like villainized form of blackness black black masculinity 
and there's a group of people that are able to um, kind of be exploited by these ideas. There's also going to be on the other side of the there's going to be a group of black men that will be exploited, exploited, yeah, exploited by these ideas of submission, um, trying to assimilate to whiteness. Um, and I think you, it comes out of this fear of being a like, I don't want to be viewed as, like, less than human. I don't want to be less less human. I don't want to be this beast. So I'm going to adopt the more human which, you know, you're loving and you're, you know, you're caring. You're empathetic. You're inclusive. You just want, you just want, what's, what do they say? Can we not just all get along? And that, that that's, that's, that's humanity, right? This idea of getting along and just just being at peace why do you have to argue you know demonic demonic and i just think who like the archetype doesn't even just represent like actual people who like i'm gonna try to be sympathetic like who have have been so like overwhelmed with the idea to assimilate and it comes down to respectability politics and the idea of like black be black people need to be we need to present ourselves a certain way. Like we need to, we need to, we need to be classy. Like we don't want to be, we don't want to be black. You know, we have to be, we don't want to be loud. We don't want to be loud. We don't want to be ghetto. We want to be civilized. We want to assimilate. But I think sometimes it could also be evident in like black masculinities, uh, uh, alignment with comedy and like, always being seen as like laughing and like no 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 that's not you'd want to word it and almost being like this entertainer always wanting to be like la make people laugh or keep them entertained like because when you're the blackie that's entertaining us we don't again we don't have to see you as a real human being but then also it feeds into some sense of validation when you're like when you are funny and uh, i do think of will smith a lot just because i think he does represent like being respectable and oh, it's really sad he represents like this idea of being respectable funny not too like problematic and it's really sad like and then how the whole oscars incident like flipped the whole situation over and i think that it, again that's that's a perfect example of these two traits and how they kind of interact with each other and kevin uh what's his face um both him too, but <laughs> but Chris 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 uh Rock. Oh, I wonder why everybody hates Chris now. Yeah, why not? So like even with everybody hates Chris, and I think that's why I kind of have a lot of like sympathy for like people are perceived as queens or what like the archetype could represent. Because sometimes you're just so like inundated with whiteness, like you're just surrounded about white with whiteness. It's literally, a, sometimes it's just a survival technique and then you lose yourself in that survival, which is sad because I think it, it is both, it's representative in both archetypes. Um, and I think like Everybody Hates Chris is just a good example of that. People say I'm like Everybody Hates Chris too. People like, like lots of people. And I think again, that's a, it, this is actually going to be a separate video. Just talk about my experience in like how I feel about both, both like archetypes. Because if I had to pick one, it would definitely be like, I feel like I'm a Like, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm a But like, oh my gosh. Because me, I'm a I'm a I am, like, like, no, I'm not. I'm not. But that's the archetype I feel like I've had to fight with, you know? And I'll talk about it in another video. Yeah, so like, I feel like I'm a You know? Um, yeah. But ultimately, I feel like black men, like, have to fight. We have to fight with these archetypes. And we're going to get into this. Well, that's all I say. Like, I'm going to get into this. We're going to talk about this. Get to it. I feel like black men have to fight with it. And then you're always fighting a losing battle because it's, like, two extremes. And it's funny. I'm not going to lie. Like, a lot of this I got from this essay I wrote like a long time ago, not a long time ago. And basically I was talking, I don't know, ugh, this video is going to be so long. Um, but basically I was talking about like these two like contrasting forms of black masculinity. Does the idea of the talented 10th like 
help them. I don't want to go into the talented 10. You need to stay on track. The talented 10 is this idea of like, and it leans again, it leans into respectability politics. Um, and it kind of, in during the civil rights, it was kind of being proposed as like this, this third um, archetype, um, black masculinity archetype, basically representing like a group of black men who are highly educated, highly intellectual, um, and had great leadership potential, that they basically, they could be the ones to help rewrite the narrative on black people. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was like a big proponent of this uh, idea of the talented tent. And it was this idea of like tackling the Negro problem uh, by uh, the best of the race being guiding the masses. And again, a lot of it's rooted in respectability politics, um, kind of elitism. And again, viewing the Negro problem as something that black people not necessarily caused, but something that they can um, undo when it's, again, it's these demonic forces that are responsible. But yeah, I think, okay, I'll end this video here. Like black men are just in this losing fight. This black, black men are in this losing fight and it's like, help us. And I'm gonna try help. I'm gonna try like, 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 we're, we're going to be doing a lot of thinking, but like, we're going to try what's, what can we do? What, how can we generate like healthy thorns? And we're going to stay on like unpacking like ideas of like, um, black masculinity, um, and how they're harmful to us. Just, just like in general. Um, and then maybe talk about like breaking free, you know? Yeah. And then also talk about my we'll get to it.